Welcome to video three of chapter one, where we are continuing on in our data chapter, and we are continuing on furthermore from video two in describing quantitative data. In the previous video, we talked about the acronym SOCS, S-O-C-S, where we talked about the really the last two letters, C and S, for center and spread of a set of quantitative data, and we're going to continue on with our first two letters, the S and the O. So the first S of SOCKS is shape. And so anytime you're asked to describe the distribution of a quantitative variable, first thing you do is typically talk about the shape of the data set. So we need to see what does the data set look like visually. So we've got some common things that we'll see and some other things, but that's what we're going to start off video three with. One of the most common shapes that we will see throughout the year is what's called approximately normal. It's what's your bell-shaped curve that you might have uh, heard about off and on again. But we can call an approximately normal uh, distribution. It's technically unimodal, which means it has one unimodal, has one hump. Uh, mode is the most frequent number, and the most frequent number, and in this case there are three approximately normal uh, distributions here. Don't think that this is just one approximately normal distribution. But you can see here that this peak represents the most common value, and there is only one most common value, which is why it is called unimodal. In A, we can see that it has about the same value, the same measurement here at about, oh, I don't know, eight or nine, but it is also one hump, and that is where the mode is located. Now, we can notice approximately normal distribution C looks a lot like A, but its center, right, if we said that the mode and technically also the median and the mean would all be located at this 8 to 9 ballpark for distribution A. That C, its shape is very, very similar. It looks like it has about the same amount of spread, right? If we thought of uh, range, uh, that would be the easiest thing to kind of examine here. But its center, where its unimodal, one-humped mode is, uh, looks like it's more about maybe 10 more above distribution's A center. But the fact is, all of these are bell-shaped. And notice distribution B, it is a taller bell-shaped, but that's fine. You can have a smaller spread. This one isn't as spread out as much as distribution A or C. It just means it has a smaller spread. So we can notice again that A and B both have about the same center, but B has a smaller spread, but they're still both approximately normal. A and C are both approximately normal. They have about the same spread, right? A is spread out this much. We'll say it's range. That's something easy to look at. Uh, C's spread looks like it's about the same measure from max to min. But the centers were different. They're located in different locations. And then if we compare B to C, we would stay, say that they are both approximately normal. They're both bell-shaped. But they both have different centers, and they both have different spreads. Next up the skewed distributions. And we're going to talk skewed right to begin with here, and then we'll talk about skewed left. Now, skewed just means that it's kind of like you have an approximately normal distribution, but you push all the data on one side. And in this case, all the data got pushed over here to the left side, which means the direction of the skewness is always described by where the tail is. And if you kind of imagine, you've got this you don't have very many values down here in this end of the distribution. And to me, it kind of looks like a tail, if you will. So the direction of the tail is how you would describe the direction of the skewness. So since the tail is on the right, this is skewed right. And this just means that we have a lot of data over here on the left side with smaller values of whatever this horizontal uh, axis is measuring here. But we have a lot of values that are on the left side very few on the right side. So flip it over and we've got a skewed left distribution. Now we have very few values that are taking these smaller values, again, whatever these values are on the horizontal axis, and we have a lot of data values that are over here on the right side that are taking more of these larger measurement values. So skewed left, skewed right, always go with the tail to describe the direction of the skewness. Next, we come to uniform, or what I'll call here roughly uniform. Uh, you guys will start to pick up on adjectives that you can use with your uh, different shapes. For instance, we could go back and say that this is probably strongly skewed left, and this is strongly skewed right. 
And we'll get more into those little things, what little adjectives that you can add here or there. So if this thing was perfectly flat, like you didn't see any little bumps in the road up here at all, we would call that just uniform. But since there's kind of some wavering, some little ups and downs in here, even if the little ups and downs look like this, if it was relatively flat, mostly flat-ish, we'll say, then we can throw in that adjective roughly. This is roughly uniform. So again, if something's relatively flat or even absolutely flat, we'll call that uniform. Then we get into things that have multiple peaks. And so bimodal, bi means two. Modal is, again, we're looking for two modes, if you will. And we kind of see that we have a peak here and we have a peak here. Uh, and so here's where we get two modes or bimodal, two peaks. And sometimes you're just maybe going to have some data sets where there's just a lot of different peaks. Okay. And if there's two or more, then we're just going to start to call it multimodal. So you're not going to see probably too much craziness like this in multimodal. But if you do see something, then you do have a, a shape name to describe it with. Now, the term symmetric can apply to other shapes that we have maybe already mentioned. So for instance, we call this our roughly uniform, but it also could be considered symmetric. Symmetric just means that you could fold it in half and it would be the same roughly on the left as it is on the right. Uh, approximately normal. You could fold it again down the middle here and it would be the same about on the left as it is on the right. And if something wasn't perfectly symmetric, like maybe with this roughly uniform distribution, you could say it's roughly symmetric or almost symmetric to kind of give those little weasel words or ish words to make it sound symmetric-ish. Uh, here's an example of a bimodal distribution where the two peaks are at exactly the same level here. And really, we could fold this thing in that middle valley, and then there's where it would be symmetric. So we'd say, hey, here's the center of the distribution, and it would describe this bimodal as symmetric. Now, let me just say, if you saw this distribution, I wouldn't say the first name I would call it would be symmetric. I would first call it approximately normal, but technically you could also call it symmetric. Same thing with this one. I would call this one bimodal first, but you could also follow it up if you really wanted to with the symmetric. Uh, likewise with the uniform. I would call this uniform first, but you could technically call it also symmetric. So again, any of these other shapes that we've already talked about, if you see those happen first, then call them those names. Now, a skewed right and a skewed left, they're not really symmetric at all. So you would just call them skewed left, skewed right, and never symmetric. But again, the approximately normal, the uniform, the bimodal, in some cases, like this bimodal is not symmetric. So I would just truly call this bimodal. So symmetric you can kind of use if no other shape really works, and it is kind of symmetric-ish. Now to the O of socks, and this is the one that people tend to get tripped up a little bit on, and we're only ever going to mention outliers really if there are outliers present. If there's a clear indication that there are no outliers present, then we really just do the S, C, and S of socks. We'll talk about the shape center spread. But really only if there are outliers present do we ever really mention outliers. So that might lead you wondering, well, what is an outlier? So the definition we're going to use for an outlier is it's a value, or it could be multiple values, that lie outside. And what we mean by lies outside is it's much smaller or larger than most of the other values in a set of data. So what does that mean? So if I went back to say, let's go to this skewed left distribution. And if I said, hey, I've got a value that's really, really close to zero. Well, if you look at that value compared to all the other values, I mean, we've got a big chunk of data that's more than four, right? And if we had a value that was all the way down here at zero, that's not like most of the rest of the data. So if we had a value all the way down here, we might refer to it as an outlier. But notice I'm putting a question mark. Do we truly call it an outlier? How far away does a value need to be from the bulk of the rest of the data to really be called an outlier? So we have a mathematical rule for determining if something is an outlier. And we're going to call that the 1.5 IQR rule. 
Now, the 1.5 IQR rule is a really simple mathematical way of determining if a value or if there are values that could be considered an outlier. So the rule goes like this. So we're going to take the first quartile, Q1. That's something we talked about in video two. That was the 25th percentile. Uh, and we're going to subtract away 1.5 IQRs. And remember, an IQR was really the difference of the third quartile and the first quartile. So when we say IQR here, we're really saying, what's the difference? What's, how much spread is there in the middle 50% of the data? And then we're going to take that number and multiply it by 1.5. And then we're going to subtract that value, whatever that value is, we're going to take it away from Q1. And that's going to take us down a ways from Q1. And then we're also going to take that 1.5 IQR value, but we're going to add on to that to Q3, so that now we're going above the third quartile. And if we have any values that are smaller than this Q1 minus 1.5 IQR, or any value that's larger than Q3 plus 1.5 IQR, then we're going to consider those values outliers. All right, so let's look at an example. So here I've got some uh, descriptive statistics. This is from uh, a statistical software um, program, and it just gives me a lot of values. And maybe I'll use all these, maybe I won't, and I'm actually not. So here's what I want you to notice. There are two sets of data here, group one and group two. And what this is telling me, this n, that's telling me my sample size. So in one set of data, I have six things, and then my other set of data, I have eight things. Now, do I know what those specific values are of all six and all eight things? No, I don't know what all those numbers are. They didn't give them to me, which is fine. Now, here's the mean. This is one of the centers. Here's median. Here's one of our centers that we talked about. The TR mean, we're going to skip. We're not really going to use TR mean. This is kind of represents the true mean. We're just going to skip over it. Just, so just ignore it. Standard deviation, we talked about this as one of our measures of spread. SE mean is, there's a common misconception that that is the mean, but it's not the mean, and this is something we'll use later on in the year, but it's the standard error of the mean. So for right now, just ignore that particular value. So here we've got two measures of center. Here we have a measure of spread. And then we come down here, and there's just more values. They're just saying, here's group one and group two again. Just to remind you that it goes group one and group two. And here are the minimum values. Here are the maximum values. Here are the first and third quartiles. So the first and third quartiles is what we needed to calculate the IQR, the interquartile range. So really, we're going to be using these values down here. So what I'm going to do is we're going to check for outliers with group one, with those six values. And then what I'm going to have you guys do is check for outliers with group two. All right, so here we go. So Q1, Q1 for group one is this 0.483. And I need to subtract away 1.5 IQRs. Well, remember, an IQR was just Q3 minus Q1. So Q3 was 3.073. And Q1, again, is this 4.83. So if I calculate what's the IQR, then that difference is 2.59. And I don't want to just subtract away one IQR. I want to subtract away 1.5 IQRs. So I'm going to take 1.5 times 2.59 and subtract that number from Q1, 0.483. But I'm also going to take Q3, which was the 3.073, and I'm going to add the 1.5 IQR number. Again, whatever that 1.5 times 2.59 value is. So in the end, if I do some math here, anything below, and really anything below this number, and that's what this math came out to be, negative 3.402, if I have any number that's smaller than that, then I consider it an outlier. And if I have any number above, and that's what this math came out to be, 6.958, that anything greater than that number is considered an outlier. Well, the question is, I don't know what my six numbers are, so how do I know if I have any outliers? And that's where the minimum and the maximum values are going to come into play. So the minimum number, the smallest number in my data set of six things up here, 
is 0 0.370. And so if I have a number that's less than negative 3.402, it's an outlier. But my smallest number is 0 0.370. I don't have any negative numbers in my six numbers. So I don't have any what we'll call lower outliers. So no outliers on the small end of my data set, on the uh, lesser end of my data set. So then we say, all right, well, if, do I have anything bigger than 6.958? And I go to my maximum. And the maximum stops at 3.620. And I don't have any numbers that are bigger than 6.958 because I know my biggest number is 3.620. So I have no outliers at all. I have no lower outliers and I have no upper outliers. So overall, group one has no outliers. So what I want you guys to do is to do the same thing that I just did here, but do that for group two. So you're going to focus your attention on group two's IQR, so you need to look at this Q1 and Q3, and you also need to use the minimum and maximum for group 2, not group 1. Now, before I end here, I just want to end with one little note. And typically people start to question, why 1.5 IQRs? Why not just 1 IQR? Why not 2 IQRs? And once upon a time, someone had to come up with a general rule. And so some statistician you know, I don't know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, I don't really know for sure. I don't know the history of the 1.5 IQR rule, but my bet is that some famous statistician many, many years ago decided that 1.5 IQRs above or below Q1 and Q3 really did a really great job of determining if numbers were um, kind of outside of the set of the rest of the other numbers, right? We said an outlier is any value that lies outside is much smaller or larger than most of the other values in a data set. And so this one guy just found, hey, 1.5 works. It's good enough. So that's really the main thing I can give you there for why it's 1.5 IQRs. It's just kind of works for most data sets. So it's not the only rule that works, but it's the main mathematical rule that we're going to use for the time being. So again, Tomorrow, I want you guys to show me your work, uh, and we'll discuss how we can mathematically verify if there are any outliers for group two. And that's all for video three.